So it's my pleasure to um, turn the floor over to Dr. Jamie Strange. Uh, Dr. Strange is a longtime bee researcher with the USGA. He was formerly at the Logan Bee Lab, um, where he primarily focused on bumblebees, but other bee uh, research work as well. Uh, we were really lucky here at Ohio State to be able to have Jamie, Jamie come and join us about two years ago uh, as professor, researcher, and uh, chair of our entomology department. Um, so Jamie, thanks so much for taking the time with us this morning, and um, I'll turn the floor over to you. And I see your slides. Sorry, I, I lost my uh, my unmute button once I went to screen shares. So. I, I hear you. <laughs> Zoom, a, Zoom is a bit chair. of a mystery. <laughs> if we can get to, okay, you should be seeing the slideshow now. Yes, I do. <clears throat> All right, so uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, this is really uh, exciting to be here um, and to be able to present to you today. Before I kick off on the, the whole B thing, which is why we're really here, I just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements. And the first is that uh, today we're celebrating the first Juneteenth uh, as a U.S. federal holiday. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, uh, President Biden uh, signed this yesterday. Uh, and um, it's a celebration of the fulfillment of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865 and it ended the federal uh, federally endorsed slavery, uh, was the end of federally endorsed slavery in the United States. I also want to acknowledge that the land that Ohio State University occupies and the land that I'm sitting on uh, occupies the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, uh, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. And specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville uh, and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. I honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historic context that have and continue to affect indigenous peoples of this land. So talking about melatology and the study of bees uh, and uh, wanna give you some definitions. We're gonna kick off into defining things, a little bit of uh, background on bees. I'm gonna throw in a lot of, or at least I hope it's a lot for some of you, um, uh, of sort of current research that's going on in bees. The real, one of my real goals is to kind of um, uh, educate you what people are studying right now and what they think is, is critical. Uh, kind of what we study is uh, often a representation of what's important. Um, so melatology is this branch of entomology, branch of biology uh, concerning the scientific study of bees. And according to Wikipedia, which had this nice concise definition, uh, it covers species uh, in the great in the clade Anthophila, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And this within the superfamily Apoidea, which includes some uh, some wasps as well. Uh, and there's about twenty thousand species, and that includes some of the common ones that you know about: bumblebees, honeybees, uh, mason bees, etc. All right, I will warn you right now up front that I will be using Latin. You've already encountered a few Latin words. You're gonna encounter more. I sympathize with those of you who would like me to speak only using uh, modern English, but uh, unfortunately science does not always cooperate with us. I was a solid C minus Latin student in my one semester of Latin in college. I did not take it again because I did not want that punishment. But uh, unfortunately, I decided to become a scientist um, and I was forced to learn a bunch of Latin or at least to be able to use it. Uh, in a lot of cases, we don't have common names for the things we're gonna talk about. Where we do, I will try to use those uh, to help you out, but where we don't, we're stuck with the Latin uh, for better or for worse. And um, so I'm gonna use it and I, I tend to spark, uh, sprinkle it through pretty, pretty freely. I found long ago, it's easier just to learn Latin than it was to learn both the Latin and the common name. So I'm trying to undo some of that habit for you, but you are going to run into some Latin in this talk. So I apologize to those of you up front who don't like me to do that. Um, of course, uh, that definition begs uh, the question, what the heck is a bee? Um, bees are in the order Hymenoptera, which includes uh, ants, wasps, sawflies, uh, and the bees as well. Uh, they're in this clade Anthophila, Anthophila being the ones that we consider to be the, the true bees. Um, B 
bees have a dependence on pollen, derived pollens, you know, from plants, from flowers. It's the male um, gamete of, of plants. Uh, and they use that to feed their larvae. One of the reasons they use it is because it tends to be pretty high in protein uh, and fat content. It's pretty nutritious, lots of vitamins and minerals in that. So it makes a great food for your developing larvae if you're a mother bee. Uh, and they use that for, for that purpose. Uh, in order to facilitate the collection of this um, pollen from plants, bees have evolved branched hairs. And those branched hairs can occur on uh, all over their bodies or just on specific areas of their bodies. Uh, but bees have these branched hairs, which allows them to pick up these little pollen grains um, more easily than just having straight hairs. Uh, they also have long tongues relative to the wasps. So wasps, you think of as sort of meat eaters. They're often feeding on caterpillars or aphids and, and um, uh, or, or even um, parasitizing other insects. Uh, but they don't typically have long tongues. The long tongues bees have relative to those are, are for really for accessing uh, the nectar, which is produced in the nectaries in plants in, in their flowers or, or other parts of the plants. There are some extra floral nectaries that exist as well. Um, and then there's a bunch of morphological uh, things. So uh, C.D. Michener, the great uh, melatologist, would have said, well, actually, uh, the, the posterior pronotal lobe um, is uh, distinct but small, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to go into the uh, morphological details, probably beyond the ones we've just covered. Um, so I'm going to spare you that part of uh, what a bee is, and, and uh, we'll just go with the, the upper things, um, long tongues, branched hairs, feeding on pollen. Uh, there's a huge variety of bees, uh, and I, I did mention that 20,000. I'm going to get into that a little bit in a minute, but um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Well, maybe not all shapes and sizes, but a, a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, this picture on the left is, is a picture of Wallace's giant bee. Um, Mega Kylie Pluto uh, and uh, Eli Wyman, a buddy of mine, is holding it there, showing us um, how big this thing is, uh, and he looks pretty happy that he he found it. Um, the uh, th this bee measures about four centimeters, which for those of you um, who want the conversion is a little over an inch and a half. Um, so that's from the the tip of the abdomen up to the top of the head. You'll notice um, if I can get my pointer up here that um, uh, these are color. Let's go with the green leaves. We have laser pointer. Um, you'll notice th these are the mandibles. So these are the jaws of that bee. They look pretty hefty there. Um, I would imagine this can bite as well as sting, but um, uh, so that's a nice, nice chunky bee. Uh, over here on the other side, we've got you know Pertida minima, um, and this is perched on the head of a carpenter bee. Some of you may know about carpenter bees. You've probably seen those. Um, these are, but these Perdida are tiny little bees, um, just itty bitty. So this may or may not be the smallest bee in the world, but, but it is certainly among the smallest of the bees. Uh, and, um, and it's a specialist on some flowers that it, that it pollinates and its small size facilitates that. Uh, there's a lot of other sort of morphological variation, morphological meaning variation in characteristics of the body. Uh, so either the size, the shape, the color, uh, special organs that are developed on the outside of the bee for pollen collection and things like that. Um, we have some that look an awful lot like wasps. Uh, these parasitic bees sometimes look this way. We've got these, you know, sort of fuzzier ones, uh, like the, uh, this is a, a blueberry bee, Habropoda laboriosa. Uh, and then we've got this Bombus pennsylvanicus, a bumblebee, uh, the, the American bumblebee here, uh, those big fuzzy bees. We have the ones that you're probably most familiar with. A lot of you. This is the you know the honeybee, the European honeybee. Um, and then again, here's that little pertida. And, and then we've got these neat metallic bees that come. This is a, a, a small carpenter bee uh, in the genus Ceratina. Uh, this is a blue orchard bee, uh, and this is a sweat bee down here. So we get different colors, different shapes, different amounts of hair, um, different striping patterns. You know, there's all sorts of things that help us tell these bees apart. Um, but these are all bees. They all fall in that category um, in that group, Anthophila. So, you know, with so many bees, you might wonder where they are. Well, this recent paper just came out, um, led by Michael Orr, looking at where bees are distributed around the world. Um, the darker colors on this map show uh, where species are most rich. And so um, there's areas of particular richness around the world uh, here in South Africa. The Mediterranean, Turkey, 
uh, in, in, uh, in, in China and um, other parts of Asia here. Generally, if you notice, there's a general pattern that a lot of these occur in dry deserts of the world. Not all of the diversity is there, but a lot of it is. And that holds true um, here in, in North America where uh, the American Southwest and, and Mexico have a lot of the, uh, the diversity of bees as well. Now, most of you know the honeybee. Most of you know the bumblebee, or maybe even several different bumblebees that you're familiar with, because there are about 260 bumblebee species in the world, and and about 40 in, or uh, excuse me, 50 in North America. Um, you may also know a few other bees. Maybe you know some sweat bees. Maybe you know mason bees or leafcutter bees. Um, but you know a few bees and. Uh, if we think about that, okay, we'll put those bees up here. But uh, there's a lot of other species out there that we don't, that you may not actually know what they are. I don't know what most of them are either, uh, quite honestly, because there's so many. And to put that in context of Ohio, where I'm sitting right now, we have about 400 to, to 500 species of bees. There's about 320 or so dots on this page. Um, so really what you're looking at is very much if you know three or four or even 20 species, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg uh, for what might occur where you're living, whatever state or province or country you're in. Um, you know, you just know the tip of the iceberg. And if we zoom out a little bit more and say we put, you know, several, maybe say 4,000 dots on the map. Um, and that's about how many are distributed in the United States. Uh, so 4,000 different species of bees. And really these three up here that, um, that we just talked about, uh, and like, again, even if you know 20, you only know a very small proportion of what's actually there. So uh, this is really, you know, as a scientist, very exciting because there's a lot of diversity uh, and a lot of um, differences within these bees. And that's what I'm gonna move on to and talk about next. Um, one of the things that is, particularly interesting and excites a lot of people who study bees for a living is this idea that there are some bees that are social and um, there are some bees that are solitary. And uh, bees, the species of bees occur across the spectrum with the solitary bees being, you know, a single mom who raises her offspring. Um, other bees tend to live in aggregations and they're somewhere along this social spectrum. And then other bee species um, are, are eusocial and they live in these complex colonies uh, where there's a single queen and lots of individuals. Um, I'm gonna break down each of these categories a little bit for you as we go forward. So you can understand some of this diversity. About 90% of all the species, those 20,000 um, species, about 90% of them are either solitary or parasitic. To break that down further, 75% or, you know, that we know of are, are considered solitary species. Um, so really, out of that 20,000, about 15,000 species of bees are solitary. Um, and probably, and, and most of those I would say are, are unstudied or very understudied. Uh, interestingly, about 15% are estimated to be parasitic. There's some arguments about exactly what that percentage is, but it, it is a, a fair sized chunk and about 10% are social. So of, all, of those, um, of those 20,000 species, there's maybe 2,000 social species that are out there. So it's actually a fairly uh, small group, really. Even though we might, they might be the ones we see the most, the honeybees, the bumblebees, um, some of the sweat bees. Uh, so we encounter those quite frequently. They're very uh, common in the environment, but as far as the number of species they represent, it's fewer. So I wanna talk a little bit about solitary bees and give you some idea about um, how solitary bees live, being that they're the ones that you might be the least familiar with. Uh, I'm gonna use this example of Andrina candida. Um, and this, this is um, from a study done by uh, Nabil Youssef and Ned Bohart back in 1968, um, where they, they dug up a bunch of nests of this species to kind of understand how this solitary bee lives its life. Um, it has an annual cycle, meaning that an egg will begin one year in the spring. It'll hatch, develop into a larvae, pupate, and then in the next spring, that that will emerge as an adult. That bee will it will lay its make its nest, lay its eggs, and then it dies. So it has a one year cycle. Generally, this is how solitary bees work. There are some solitary bees where they might have multiple generations within a year. Um, that's a condition we call multivoltinism, where one generation a year is univoltinism. Um, that will be on the exam later, so write it down. 
uh, but they're different lifestyles. That's all I'm saying here. And, um, and uh, these ones typically have this annual colony life cycle or annual um, life cycle for the individuals. Uh, this particular species nests in the soil about 10 centimeters deep. Some uh, solitary species that nest in the soil will nest much deeper. Some solitary species don't nest in the soil. They nest in cavities in, in stems of, of plants or in uh, wood, wood holes bored into wood by beetles and things like that. There are bees that live in snail shells uh, that have been abandoned. So uh, there are a lot of different um, habitats that solitary bees will um, occupy. Um, I've found uh, leaf cutting bee nests in the out, you know, in, in outlet plugs on outside outlets of the house. And probably some of you have run into similar situations. Um, so they're, they can be very opportunistic as to where they nest. Um, but this particular species goes about 10 centimeters deep. Some species go much deeper. Um, some much more shallow. Uh, this species also makes, um, what you have here is this nest tube um, that, that they dig and they actually dig it out. And this is um, called tumuli. This is the, the dirt that's been expelled from this nest, forms a little mound. Eventually uh, wind and water will wash it away and it'll just be, just be a little hole. But they dig this and then they go in and they dig these little um, pockets here. They'll provision them with uh, pollen that they collect. Here's a pollen ball. This is a picture from that same study. Um, they provision it with this pollen ball and they lay an egg on it. That egg hatches and here's a larvae um, that is hatched and it's eating this pollen ball. Uh, once it consumes that, it'll pupate uh, and um, go through this pupil stage and then it will, the next year, emerge as an adult. Uh, this particular species only has two to maybe four cells per each tube that it, that it digs down here. Um, however, uh, some species of bees will put many more um, uh, nest or rather egg cells uh, within a um, particular burrow. Uh, and there will, some species will only dig one burrow and some species like this one will dig multiple burrows with just a few individuals. Uh, after the bee, after this female bee provisions the nest with pollen, it doesn't, and, and lays its eggs, it doesn't really provide more brood care um, beyond that. They, they tend to go and then they dig the nest next. In, in this case, they plug this one up uh, they put a little plug at the top to keep parasites from coming in, um, but then they move on to the next one and dig a new tunnel. A uh, couple things to note too is that each female can reproduce, uh, and that becomes important in distinguishing it from um, sociality, uh, and there's no overlap of generations. In other words, you don't have an adult female um, mother with her adult female daughter in the nest at the same time. So you sociality or sociality or use sociality, as we often call um, the more highly evolved aspects of this, um, involve uh, sort of the opposite of that. So we have this reproductive, reproductive division of labor um, where we have a queen who lays the eggs uh, and is responsible for reproducing. So she's mated and lays eggs. We have workers who are sterile females that, that don't lay eggs. Uh, and then we have males um, in some species called drones. Um, that, that whose primary purpose is uh, reproduction. Um, so they, they are mostly there just to mate with the females. Um, overlapping generations uh, signified by this point, this is a stylized bumblebee nest diagram. Uh, here are the little workers down here and there you can see one's um, bringing in honey and putting it in these, uh, or bringing nectar and putting it in these honey pots. Um, another one's sitting here on a little lump of brood uh, helping to uh, maintain that brood temperature. Uh, and then here's the queen and she's up there laying eggs and, and, uh, and, uh, and that's her main goal at that point. Uh, bumblebees uh, have this annual colony cycle. So while they have this overlap of generations at the end of the year, the workers and the males all die off after, after the queen and uh, males mate, after the new queens and males mate. Uh, that queen will overwinter by herself. And then in the spring, she founds a nest um, by herself. Uh, this is called primitively eusocial, unlike honeybees, where a number of the workers will survive the winter with the queen and help her get the nest going again the following spring. Um, so uh, there are different levels of eusociality as well, but they all um, then contribute to this cooperative care of the young or care of the brood where all of the queen and the workers in the case of bumblebees or uh, in the case of honeybees, just multiple workers will take care of offspring. So um, 
this is sociality. And again, it's probably the, the least common of the ways that bees live, but it is one that a lot of you know about. So, uh, and, and it's an important one as well, because it allows us to get very large colonies at times with lots of bees out there pollinating and doing things. Uh, there's also the parasitic or cuckoo bees. Um, and this is a, a really uh, interesting group. So um, in this, each of the females can reproduce much like the solitary bees. Um, they're often host specific so that you'll have a uh, parasitic species that parasitizes only one or two other species. They're, they don't necessarily go around and parasitize every bee they see, um, but they do focus on certain species. Uh, they tend to invade the nest. They lay their eggs uh, on the pollen mass that's been uh, put there by the host bee. Uh, and then that, that female leaves. She may or may not come back to that uh, particular nest later. Uh, the larvae then hatches out of the egg. And usually what these parasitic ones do is they'll eat the egg of the host that's been laid on the pollen mass. And then they eat that pollen mass. They don't collect pollen themselves in provision, which is why they're considered parasites. And a lot of them sort of lack a lot of hair. So they're also thought to be relatively poor pollinators. They may of course um, engage in incidental pollination because a lot of them do forage for uh, nectar uh, and probably eat some pollen to help develop their ovaries as adults. Uh, social parasites are a subgroup of the cuckoo bees. Um, and, and so within, for example, bumblebees, I'll talk about that. There are a, uh, a number of species of parasitic bumblebees that don't actually produce a, a, a worker cast of their own. So the, the parasitic queen will invade a nest that's a, an established nest of bumblebees. Um, and she will usurp the queen that's in there, um, either by killing her or displacing her. And then she'll use the workers of that previous, of the host queen, to raise her own generation of reproductive adults, but there are no workers that she is the direct mother of, only the ones that she's usurped. Um, and it's not always that usurpation happens um, uh, by strict parasites. So sometimes one species of bumblebee that actually can produce uh, a worker cast will invade a nest, take it over uh, and usurp that, and they'll, they'll use um, that nest themselves. So um, there's a spectrum of parasitism. Okay, this is to remind me that I need to have a pro-parasite rant here because there's a lot of discussion. People get upset when they see parasites or when they see things that they think are hurting their bees. And I'm here to tell you that parasites are great. Parasites are an indication of a healthy ecosystem. Um, these are also native bees. It's 15% of the bee species we see out there are parasitic bees. Uh, and that's telling us that what that sort of tells us is that the populations of some of the native bees that they're parasitizing are also healthy um, because they can support parasite populations. So when you read something about don't make a bee hotel because after a couple of years, you see a lot of parasites, I'm telling you that that's cool. And you can learn a lot by watching parasites. They're really interesting. And they do show us that the ecosystem we, we have are functioning. Um, so that's the end of my parasite rant. I just want to throw it out there. I think parasitic bees are awesome. And I think you should explore a little bit about what they do. Um, and, and, uh, the lifestyles they lead, which are pretty fascinating and the evolutionary adaptations they show are really pretty incredible. So there you go. I'll leave it at that. Um, parasites rule, uh, so historically, much of the effort of melatologists has gone to sort of cataloging the 20,000 plus species. Um, we generally group the work of these folks into taxonomy or systematics. Um, and uh, these, these two disciplines have given us a, a sort of structure of bees and organization uh, that includes seven different families to sort of uh, largely encompass the diversity we see. We've got the malidity, the APD, which includes the honeybees, the bumblebees, carpenter bees, and a bunch of others. Um, the megachylidae, uh, which include the leafcutter bees, the mason bees, um, andrenidae, which are the mining bees, um, helictidae, the sweat bees, the plaster bees, the calididae, and the stenotridae, which is this um, Australian group of large bees in Australia. We don't have any in the United States, but, but they are another family. So we have these large groups that we have. Uh, taxonomy being the science of description, identification, nomenclature, so how we name the bees. They're the ones that we 
can blame for the Latin that I nearly failed as an undergraduate, um, uh, and classification. Uh, this allows us to differentiate the species using these morphological or physical characteristics that we see on them, uh, behavior, we use genetics, et cetera, um, and provides these names for organisms like with the genus and species. So that's the Latin. So when I say Bombus pennsylvanicus, um, that's a bumblebee, which is Bombus, uh, and all the bumblebees are Bombus. Uh, and Pennsylvanicus being um, the, the species name, and that's the American, the, the common name for that is the American bumblebee. It's not the Pennsylvania bumblebee, which you would think it is, but you know, it's difficult. Uh, systematics, however, uh, in contrast, is the science of discovering and describing those evolutionary relationships among organisms. So um, taxonomy helps us describe what they are and, and put them uh, in categories that are of closely related ones and, and systematics then looks at like how these things evolved. There are a number of um, taxonomic tools out there to help you with identifications and understanding how um, the bees go. There's some that are uh, online tools that I think are worth um, invest investigating. Discoverlife.org, iNaturalist, uh, the sort of companion app to that seek. Um, is also available, um, bug guide. There's a bunch of stuff I'm gonna cover at the end about um, different um, programs you get involved with to help identify bees and catalog them. But um, there are, these are just some of the big ones. There of course are a ton of books, um, field guides to various bee groups and things like that. One of the coolest things, this is a great paper came out this year. It's, it's exciting, it's in its infancy I would say, but has a lot of potential in the future is using um, artificial intelligence, deep learning, computer vision, combining these things to help us identify species of bees uh, from pictures. Because of course, what are we doing now? We're taking a lot of pictures of bees, we're uploading them onto the web, uh, and we're having, you know, in some cases, people like me go in uh, and identify them one by one, picture by picture. Um, that can take a lot of time and a lot of energy. And um, uh, we get these backlogs because it's, you know, we're, we all have other jobs as well. We do, you know, when we do online identification of bees, it's, it's volunteer work generally. Um, so it can take a lot of time to get through those. Uh, this is really exciting because it can take pictures and it can actually um, place these individual bees uh, into groups. And so we've got, you know, in this case, this is uh, for you um, West Coasters here. This is Bombus melanopygus, both of these color forms. It's a black form, which is mostly in California. Um, and Southern Oregon. And then there's this red form, which occurs throughout the rest of the range in the, in the Pacific Northwest and the Intermountain West. Um, this bee is called, it's uh, uh, Melanopius, the black-tailed bumblebee. Um, it, uh, it, it, it can identify both of these um, different color morphs as the same species. It places them into that when you use this. Um, here's two different forms of the rusty patch bumblebee are, are currently our own, our federally endangered species of bumblebee. Um, it can take these two different color forms. This is the worker, this is the queen, and it can place them into the same grouping um, with this artificial intelligence. And likewise, it separates out these other species um, that are flying around in the area. Um, and so this is really exciting. This is a paper just came out this year. So it'll be exciting to see how this develops and how good it gets at identifying these, um, these bees from pictures. And I think it gives us a chance to really um, streamline our work and, and make give us a lot more ability to, to get these things done. Okay, so now we know that what a bee is, what a bee is, why should we care? And this is a lot of what, you know, sort of melatology does is it's studying um, the, the values of bees and the habits of bees and the things they do. Um, we can think of it in two ways. So there's ecosystem services and those would be these benefits um, provided to humans by an organism, in this case, bees. Uh, the big ones being pollination and, um, you know, and then there's these cultural benefits, things like uh, honey, wax, pollen, but also, you know, the benefits we have of coming together in beekeeping clubs or, or uh, in a group like this. So there, you know, there, there are um, sort of also these unspoken benefits of just being able to gather and talk about bees and be excited about it. Um, there's agricultural value to bees. I think this is probably where most of the interest in bees historically has come from. Um, they pollinate, you know, both wild and managed bees are, are effective pollinators in agricultural production. And I just listed a, a bunch here, you probably already read through that list, so I'm not gonna bother doing it for you, but there are a lot of different bees that are used commercially and managed commercially um, to, for production. 
and uh, and and they give us quite a bit of value and and help us with the diet that we we eat. Um, commercial pollinators. This is just again to sort of highlight these. These are honeybees, honeybee hives. Most of you have probably seen something that looks a lot like this. This is a bumblebee uh, colony that you can purchase commercially to um, to pollinate. Generally, they're used in greenhouses. In this case, you see some strawberries there, but uh, the main market is for greenhouse grown tomatoes. Uh, but but they sell a lot for other things as well. Um, and then there's uh, then there's these. Uh, this is a uh, Alfalfa leaf cutting bee cells in a in a bee board just to show you the individual cells where uh, individual larvae or pupae is living at this moment. Um, and they uh, we have these nesting boards that are moved around and then these cells are used commercially. And then this is a blue orchard bee, another commercial bee uh, that is sold in North America. So there are a number of labs that look at bees in agriculture and study um, you know, ways to keep bees healthy, ways to manage bees, how to be efficient with those. Uh, and I'm just highlighting a few. I'm not trying to slide into the other labs out there. I just pulled the ones that I know. Uh, this is my former workplace, the Pollinating uh, Insect Biology Management and Systematics Research Unit, which is a USDA lab that focus just, focuses just on the non-honeybees. So bumblebees, uh, in this case of this picture, uh, I think these are uh, mason bees in this. Um, but also leaf cutting bees and, and others um, that have agricultural importance. Uh, there's you know, labs across the country, again, probably in most of the states uh, and, and provinces, there's at least one lab where somebody is studying bees at this point uh, in some aspect of them. I wanna highlight a little bit of work from our department. This is Reed Johnson. Um, he works, at, really, he's doing a lot of work with honeybees, um, but other species as well, but he really wants to understand the impacts of agriculture on bees. And so he's got a couple of ongoing studies. One is looking at toxicology, and that's how pesticides and heavy metals in the environment are impacting um, various species of bees, honeybees, bumblebees, um, and squash bees uh, in one experiment that he's doing. Um, so, you know, how do these things that bees commonly run, run into, how do they affect their growth and development? Um, those are the kind of questions he's asking there. He's using these genomic techniques to be able to investigate the kinds of pollen that bees are foraging on. Uh, and so you send him a sample of pollen and he can analyze it uh, and tell you what species of plants that pollen was derived from, uh, just based on the pollen loads that your bees are bringing in, um, if you've got honeybees. Uh, and then he's also uh, understanding the impacts of soybeans on, on honeybee health and how, you know, it's for a long time, soybeans were sort of thought of as like really kind of neutral for, for honeybees, like, uh, and, and did they do anything? But it turns out that actually a lot of soybean uh, cultivars produce a lot of nectar and, and even pollen that the, uh, the bees use to develop their colonies. And, and how do you then keep bees safe in areas where there's a lot of uh, soybeans that might be being sprayed by pesticides? So all these projects he's got are interacting uh, and, and understanding how agriculture affects bees and how bees also affect agriculture are, are one of the main things we do as bee researchers. So there's a lot of ecological importance to bees. Um, and, and we think of them in wildlands. And I think, uh, you know, at least a lot of my work has been in areas that are less agricultural and more um, sort of mountain meadows and, and uh, uh, you know, more, more pristine areas, but, but not always. And, but bees are important for those pollination because especially the native bees, um, we're not putting honeybees out on a lot of those sites for pollination. We're relying on the bees that are there to do this in our ecosystems. Um, bees are, uh, native bees especially can also be very important in rare plant pollination. Uh, we do a lot of study of community ecology to understand how pollination affects those communities. Uh, and then bees are, can also be seen as ecological indicators. So how healthy is the environment? Uh, is there pesticide toxicity going on? Uh, how is climate change impacting organisms? Uh, how does habitat loss affect these? These are great study organisms for all of these things. Uh, and I'm going to highlight next, coming up here for the next, a couple of really recent studies. I've tried to pull some of the recent literature for things I think are like really cool stuff that's going on um, and uh, in, in a lot of these categories. So I'm going to run through a few of those um, before we move on to conservation. But um, this is from a study by John Mola, who's right now, he was at UC Davis. He's now at, um, with the USGS uh, in Colorado. And um, 
he, they did a study, this was part of his uh, PhD dissertation. He was looking at these meadows in the mountains of Northern California and studying bumblebees, uh, focusing on two species of bumblebees that were there. And he was interested to know that how forests affect bee dispersal throughout these mountain meadow complexes. So you've got a meadow and then you've got, you can see in these pictures over here, these tree lines and often you can have, you know, a kilometer or so of trees before the next meadow. And so how does this affect dispersal of, of these bumblebees across the landscape? And are these meadows kind of isolated from one another? And so he collected throughout all these meadows over here and up here and throughout California, um, in this area of California, I should say, uh, and looked at whether or not these bees were from single nests were going to multiple meadows. Um, and so what was really neat was he saw that, yeah, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases, like this one species of bumblebee, uh, the Vosnesensky bumblebee, um, this or, or yellow-faced bumblebee, as some people call it, was moving pretty freely um, across these meadow complexes, and it didn't seem to be isolated at all. This other um, bee uh, called Bombus bifarius, the, the name just changed. Thank you, taxonomists, once again. Um, this is now Bombus uh, vancouverensis, which is the Vancouver bumblebee. Um, this one didn't fly nearly as far. It didn't use as many of those meadows from site to site. Uh, and, and so, but, but what's interesting is that those probably are really important in single meadows. Single colonies do a lot of impact there. Um, but these other species are moving, maybe moving a lot of pollen from meadow to meadow and causing a lot of the more sort of plant genetic admixture that's out there. Uh, at the same time, he calculated these um, estimated foraging distances. And you can see this is Bombus bifarius it only goes probably about 250 meters from its nest on average. Um, it stays pretty close to home. Whereas this Vosnesensky um, bumblebee will go out almost two kilometers. That's, you know, that's well over a mile. So um, pretty striking difference in foraging range. Uh, I think this is a kind of a neat study to show how uh, bees are moving across the landscape and the potential impacts of pollen movement that they're, they're um, doing for plants as well. Another species, this one's from Ohio, this was done at uh, Miami University. Um, this, uh, they, they did this study removing um, the flowers of, and I don't, I, I, didn't, I, I can only imagine how hard it is to remove flowers of Amur honeysuckle. Um, so they took the flowers from this invasive plant that grows on forest edges uh, and they removed a bunch and they looked at the impacts on the bee community from removal of of just the, that floral resource, um, comparing it to areas where they didn't remove that floral resource. Uh, and what was interesting is it seems like when the honeysuckle flowers are there, it increases the number of large bees that are foraging on those fields adjacent to the forest edges. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Oh, so we get more big bees, probably because those big bees come in to take advantage of this honeysuckle. Um, but what they saw was that after two years of removal, you actually saw more species uh, that were coming into these fields uh, adjacent to these edges where they remove the flowers. So it actually increases species richness to remove the invasive, uh, which is really neat. So we get more native bees, more smaller bees coming in, um, and, uh, and, and also a higher number of bees on the fields uh, once this honeysuckle is removed. And so this has some really, I think, just really cool implications for um, habitat restoration and removal of the invasive species as they're in landscapes and I'm probably, uh, I don't need reason to cut honeysuckle out, I'll do that um, anyway, but, but I think this is a great um, uh, demonstration that it actually can be useful in restoring bee um, communities by getting rid of some of these invasives. Uh, here's the study that actually was, I was involved in. This was uh, showing some, uh, how pesticides have impacted bees. So some of you might remember uh, if we have some Oregonians out there, there was a bee kill in Wilsonville, Oregon, I think it was 2013. Um, this, uh, th this isn't, paper isn't out yet, it's, it's in press, so we're hoping to see it in the next week or two. Um, but we took a lot of those um, bees, and this was in conjunction with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation out in Portland. Um, and th these bees were killed, people reported this kill, and uh, Rich Hatfield, whose hand is shown here, um, for scale with a pencil, can, you can see how many dead bumblebees are lying in this parking lot and there's just thousands and thousands. And we, we did some estimates and, and estimated there are about 55,000, a minimum of 55,000 dead bumblebees in this parking lot after this uh, pesticide spray. Um, 
we then took a subsample of those bees and we tried we wanted to know how much impact that the uh this one particular bee poisoning had on colonies in the area and we estimated that that the number of bees that would were killed uh would were about six represented about 600 different colonies and this is just that species of Vosnesensky bumblebee this doesn't include other bumblebee species so almost 600 colonies of, of bumblebees were a foraging in this one single parking lot um, and b were impacted by this bee kill um, that's that's an immense um, number of colonies and a huge impact so we can see that like we have to be really careful about these pesticides because bees may be traveling again remember from john mola's study these bees might be coming in two or more kilometers to forage on this parking lot um, so the, the spray that you do in one place is an, impacting a very large area and a lot of colonies. Uh, this is a study actually uh, also out of Ohio State University, um, Mary Gardner's lab uh, and Dr. Katie Turo, who just defended her dissertation, did this work. Um, looking at the effects of urbanization and habitat loss on, on bee communities. And so uh, on the left here, uh, again, Latin, uh, this is from them, so you can't blame me for this Latin. Uh, these are the plant species, uh, and then on the right are the bee species. So what you what this shows you, um, these are network diagrams. This is Apis mellifera, the honeybee, bumblebees, uh, leafcutter bees, agapostamin or some sweat bees, uh, and then what plants they uh, fed on. So trifolium uh, is uh, clover, and you can see that Apis mellifera has a very strong connection to trifolium, as does uh, bombus, the bumblebees. So these are two species that really use trifolium. Uh, the other bee species, Agapostamin, doesn't even seem to care about trifolium at all. Um, and so uh, this is sort of showing how various bee species connect to the plants in their environment. Um, you also, so, so this was done in, in these vacant lots in Cleveland to look at how um, removal of homes and, and vacancy impact bee communities. And what they saw is that more species uh, and higher numbers of small bees uh, were found is the amount of green space around these lots increases. So if you have vacant lots that are near a lot of other vacant lots and there's a lot of green space, um, you get you get more bee species uh, and, and higher numbers of these small ones um, that can't necessarily disperse very well. Uh, so if you have parks and, and uh, greenways within a city, you can increase the number of species you've got. Uh, and that's one of the take home messages from this. But also what was very interesting, we think of bees as needing, uh, you know, we I just talked about invasive species, but in some ways these non-native species, these uh, the, the clover, which is not native, um, is supporting a lot of, of bee diversity in these urban areas. We can probably um, increase bees even more by increasing the amount of native plant species that we're, we're putting in, in these green spaces. Um, but this is a really, uh, interesting study, and it, it does show us those impacts of urbanization uh, on our bee communities and, and how those bees are functioning in these environments. Uh, and then uh, another species, or another study I just wanted to highlight, it's the last one I've got. So this is looking at pathology. Um, we're, we're always, you know, we, we hear bees are sick. We, see, we, we understand that, that bees are declining in some cases. Um, and so what gets them sick? Um, this recent study by Laura Figueroa, uh, and um, uh, who's, who uh, was working with Scott McGart at um, uh, Cornell University. They did this study and looked at um, Crithidia bombi, which is this gut pathogen that affects bumblebees, bombi being from bombus or from the bumblebees. So there's this gut pathogen. Um, it, it, can, it causes colony declines in, in individual colonies of bumblebees um, and some other, some other pathologies. Uh, and they were looking to see whether nutritional stress is a factor in, in how severe this is. And they actually looked across species. So they looked at it in blue orchard bees and in alfalfa leaf cutting bees to see if this pathogen A could infect those and B what the impacts of nutritional stress were on this. And what they found was that access to pollen actually improved survival of infected bees. Uh, and this underscores for us how important having good nutrition for bees is so that they can, uh, they can withstand some of these parasite um, and pesticide effects that they might run into. And that declines and, and disease are not always simple, but there's often complex factors that feed into what makes a bee sick at any given time. Uh, and so we can't just say, this is the thing that's causing it. It's often multiple things that feed into this. So I just wanna move into um, 
some talk about um, conservation and community science efforts uh, to kind of wrap up this hour. Uh, there's, uh, Denise pointed out the uh, US Native, National Native Bee Monitoring Research Coordination Network. Uh, and um, I wanna just throw that up here, this page. If you go to this webpage, you can just um, Google US National Native Bee Monitoring and it'll come up. Um, and uh, we also have, there's a Twitter pay, uh, Twitter feed out there you can follow and probably some other social media that I'm, I'm unaware of, but uh, go check it out. Um, there's some interesting reading. It, we're, we're just sort of building this out. This is led by Hollis Woodard at UC Riverside. I'm a part of the organizing group for this, and I encourage you to, to see what we're doing. There's also a number of um, links and things here that you can follow. This is a relatively new effort. If you're on that and you click on the community science page or community science tab up here, it'll take you to this page and it'll tell you, here's how you can help uh, collect data on native bees. Um, and so you can um, scroll down below this and there are uh, a bunch of um, tabs I'm gonna show you in a second. Here's the website. So it's usnativebees.com and that'll get you there. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. Some of you may have come here because of that site. So you probably already know that. There's links on there to, on that page about community science, uh, to the Great Sunflower Project, uh, to uh, iNaturalist projects, uh, and also to Bumblebee Watch among others. And there's a bunch of state level projects as well uh, that you can access on that page um, uh, and click through. So you can get involved in bee monitoring and helping scientists like me and the other folks, some of the other folks I highlighted do their work. Um, and understand what's going on with bees and, and track them. So that is the end of the slideshow. I finished 10 minutes early, so I guess we have time for Q&A, Denise. That's great, Jamie, because there are, thank you so much for that great overview. There are a lot of really good questions. Um, and so the, the, the first question that came to the top is about, um, um, soil nesting bees, uh, one of the questions a little further down was uh, what percentage of bees are soil nesting of those solitary bees? And then the specific question was, what's the effects of uh, wood chip mulch on, on bees? Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't know what the percentage of soil nesting bees is. It is, I believe the majority of bee species actually are soil nesters um, uh, and, you know, it part of that can depend on how you define it too like a lot of um bumblebees will nest in the soil um but yeah a lot of bee species it is a, a huge proportion of of the species uh, i don't know the exact percentage though um but it is the majority and then um yeah so uh wood mulch you know i think this is a great question there's i, I and i think I'll, i'm going to expand the question so one might ask um Oh, we, we have an answer. 70% of, uh, I guess that's 70% of um, uh, bee species are soil nesters. Thank you. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so I would expand the question to say like, what is the impacts of, of bark mulch? Um, what are the impact of uh, putting down, you know, if you put down uh, pebbles or rocks to cover your landscape? Um, uh, what are the impacts of uh, um, weed barrier cloth? And so you can see like the, a lot of that probably depends um, and, and where you are uh, and where you're putting it, how much of the land you're covering with, it, with these various treatments. Um, we know that putting down a weed barrier, the bees can only go so deep. So any species that needs to go deeper than that won't nest in places where there's weed barrier down. Um, uh, I, with bark mulch, you can put bark mulch down that can exclude bees from getting into, um, a lot of them prefer bare soil and they wanna have a bare soil to go into. Um, uh, rocks, in some cases, you can put these pebbles down, sort of stream pebbles, and that'll, you know, be a nice barrier. The bees can often get down between it, but sometimes they don't like that either. So um, my, you know, advice, if I were to give advice, would be that um, leaving some bare ground is, is a, a good policy. Um, you can probably partition parts of any land you're dealing with uh, to some which is just bare soil, others which is, um, uh, has, has, uh, pebbles, some has wood bark. So all these things, they're not all bad. Sometimes um, the bees do fine with them, uh, but you probably, the more complex your habitat is, the more species you're going to be accommodating. So uh, I would say like bark mulch over everything's probably not good. Um, leaving some bare ground is probably good. And if you know you have a nesting aggregation, then dumping bark mulch on it's probably a bad idea. Okay. 
Great. There was a question about uh, the current status on banning certain pesticides for for bee or pollinator health, and I'll let you you know take these questions whatever direction you'd like to. Um, uh, a side question was also about herbicides and whether herbicides harm bees. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I I'm not a pesticide specialist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so there are efforts, of course, Euro Europeans have banned some pesticides. I believe the Canadians have banned some. Um, well, in the United States, we don't have, I mean, there have been pesticides which are banned in the US um, for various reasons as well. Um, as far as banning things like neonicotinoids, um, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's happened in most places. I don't think it's um, likely right now, but uh, that's, that's not to say, I could be wrong. There might be efforts out there to, to do this um, uh, from regulators. But uh, yeah, I think there's certainly some pesticides which are more dangerous to bees. Um, probably a lot of those are context dependent too, like this one in um, Oregon that I was part of that study. The, the, the pesticides were applied against label recommendations. Um, so it was applied to blooming flowers while bees were foraging. Um, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So. Uh, there's probably a lot of space where we can tighten up regulations, where we can use education to combat a lot of these things, um, for sure. As far as uh, herbicides, herbicides, um, again, it's a complex thing. Like if you're trying to get rid of invasive plants and uh, reseed a, a native prairie or replant a native prairie, you might want to come in with herbicides to uh, eliminate some of that weed pressure so that you can get your prairie established. Um, that's, that's pretty common practice. And, and um, if you're using it around for spot treatments, maybe that's fine. Uh, you know, a lot of the herbicides, direct contact on bees are less dangerous, but if you're removing flowering species, um, there, there's definite harms. Um, there can be harms there. And, and I would say that, you know, these are chemicals. Uh, I would not personally drink Roundup um, uh, and I wouldn't spray it directly onto bees um, because they're organic chemicals that can have negative impacts. So um, in the same way that we wouldn't drink gasoline. Um, so they're, you know, they're chemicals that we need to be careful of. Um, I, I, again, I'm not an expert on chemistry and toxicology, so I don't want to say too much about it, but I, I know that um, you need to be careful with them. You need to follow the label and, um, and, and be respectful of that. And I, and there are ongoing efforts to understand and uh, regulate these things. So Okay. I'll leave it there. Um, how do you feel about insect houses for solitary bees and um, how they should be used or and or cleaned? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of bee hotels. I think they're um, great. Uh, you you know, there's a, a broad spectrum of, of what you can do with these. Um, you can put them out. You can uh, get the ones with the little straws that you remove and clean every year uh, and and um, and and clean that up to get rid of pathogens and parasites that are in there. Um, I've done, you know, a lot of my expertise is on um, looking at pathogens and parasites. I love them. I think they're really cool. And I like to know how they interact with the organisms. I like to see that system, that ecosystem functioning. So I'm probably a little messier than most people would be, but, um, but you can, you know, create an area that becomes just, you know, full of parasites and pathogens where your normal bees are less, um, or no, I shouldn't say normal bees, the bees that you want to pollinate your, your plants around your house and, and on your property, where, where they're disadvantaged. And so um, keeping those things clean, not spreading disease all, all around is probably a good idea. Um, so I, I sort of go for that middle ground. I want to see these things. I want to be able to observe the, the different um, organisms that are using these and, and watch them. But at the same time, not moving those around the landscape and spreading them everywhere uh, is, is useful. Okay, so uh, how do you feel about the murder hornet and is it gonna have an effect on uh, North American bee populations? So you get to use your crystal ball here. Oh yeah, this is now, now we're going out way on the limb. This is um, complete speculation. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about the murder hornet. Uh, you know, I think locally in, um, my cat's about to join us everyone. So if you like cats, here she comes. Uh, the, the murder hornet, um, you know, I think locally it could cause problems for certain beekeepers. I don't want to downplay it as an issue if, if you are a beekeeper and they're, they're affecting you. Right now, they seem, you know, relatively relegated to the Pacific Northwest. There's folks up there monitoring them and trying to work on eradication protocols. Um, 
that would be the ideal. It's an invasive species. We don't need it here. We don't want it here. Um, but as you know, whether or not it's going to, you know, they seem to be pests primarily of, of honeybee colonies. So I don't think we have a lot of evidence they go after native bees at this point, although they may go after some. Um, but I think, you know, it's a it's probably not the thing, you know, of, of the things we need to really worry about right now. There are people working on it. And um, until they tell us we should panic, I don't think we should. Can you talk about commercial um, pollinators and whether they outcompete some of our native bees? <laughs> there's the, uh, the million dollar question. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a growing body of evidence that commercial pollinators are competing with uh, our native bees. Um, we, it makes sense. There's, uh, you know, just logically, uh, if you put more bees in an environment, they're going to use more resources. Um, so yeah, do they compete with native bees? Yes. Are they out competing native bees? Well, that's a little loaded because then we have to define what out competing means. And um, is that that we're seeing like uh, they're driving bees to extinction? Or are you just talking about like, well, they're they're beating them to some resources and stripping it out. So yeah, I think there's definite competition. My real concern more than necessarily direct competition for food uh, resources um, is more the, the issue that when we move a colony of bumblebees, say we buy a bumblebee colony and we've got it, we move it to another place, um, we're moving everything that's in that colony with it. So any disease that's in there, any parasites that are in there, those are being moved. And I said, I like diseases and parasites, but remember I said, I, I wanna watch them in one place. I don't wanna move them around, right? And so I think that's the big threat that we run into with bees. And we've seen it over and over again, that native bees populations get sick uh, and it's often tied to commercial bee movements. So um, we have to be really careful. We need to make sure that our commercial bees are, are clean um, and that they're disease free when we're moving them around. Okay, there's a couple of questions about high temperatures. Uh, one, a few questions are around why bees prefer hot, dry places. Um, and then kind of on the side are, what about these fluctuating temperatures? We in Ohio have had some really warm early, you know, hot, actually 90s early spring temperatures and some very low temperatures. Others in the other parts have had similar uh, fluctuations. And how does that affect um, bees? Hey, Kitty. Do you wanna answer this question? The, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great, it's a great question. So I, I would say like, do bees prefer hot, dry temperatures? Well, some do. And that's, you know, we, obviously there are a lot of species that, that um, occupy those areas. And that is, uh, you know, maybe due to seasonality, they have longer seasons. They, there's, a, there can actually be a lot of floral resources in hot, dry places and a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of different habitats, microhabitats that evolve in these deserts around stream areas and around mountaintops and, and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, chances and a lot of niches for bees to occupy. So that may be why there's, um, we see a higher diversity there. Um, but remember, you know, bumblebees tend to increase in diversity the higher up the mountain you go or the farther north you go. So some groups of bees actually do really well in these cooler, um, wetter environments as well. So um, so there are, you know, just because there's only a few species doesn't mean there aren't a lot of bees because uh, when you get bumblebees, you get these colonies that can be pretty large and, and occupy a lot of space. Um, the second part of that question was about changing temperatures, right? Fluctuations in the spring. And uh, several people noted that they weren't seeing a lot of bees this spring. And so is that related to temperature fluctuations? How do bees deal with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So temperature fluctuations can be, can be tricky. Um, a lot of bees have, there are a lot of bees that have pretty good adaptations to getting away from heat. Um, the ground nesting bees, for example, when you get a couple inches under the soil, um, it gets pretty comfortable. Um, that, that soil layer moderates temperature changes a lot. It's not, you know, a, a panacea. The bees themselves can actually get, get too warm. Floral resources can dry up and disappear. Certainly, if you're seeing that where floral resources are drying up, you're going to see fewer bees in that environment. Um, bees do tend to be fairly adaptable, but, th but there are some that uh, experience those temperature stresses. We don't know a ton about it at this point. We do know that um, some studies have shown that, that within bumblebees that are pretty well studied, that the, the ranges that they occupy seem to be moving north, um, the southern edge of those ranges. So 
Um, it does seem that they, and, and we also know that they're also moving in the West, Western US and Canada, they're moving up mountain ranges. So those that used to occur close to the base of mountains are now moving up and occurring at higher elevations as, as climate changes. So um, we do know that there's some impacts of climate change on bee distributions. We don't, we have a long way to go before I think we can answer some of those questions about what happens. As far as like seeing not a lot of bees this spring versus um, last spring, you know, again, a lot of that will depend on um, just those natural fluctuations in populations, some of which are, can, can do a species in, some of which may be incidental. Maybe one year you have low bee populations, the next year you have high bee populations. It could be driven by weather events or climate. It could also be driven by pathogens, pesticides, and other things. Without knowing that habitat and studying, it's really hard to sort of speculate broadly what causes those. It's, it is one of the frustrating things because people ask the question all the time. I haven't seen any bees this spring. What's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, I, I can tell you about my garden, but, um, but beyond that, it, it, you really do have to spend a lot of time studying these habitats to get the, the idea of where things are moving um, and long trends. I have a lot of really great questions, folks. Thanks for, for typing all those in. Here's another one that's uh, rather difficult to answer, maybe big to answer. Um, does mosquito spraying in neighborhood affect bees and how? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, you know, mosquito abatement uh, is, is important because mosquitoes are, you know, disease vectors, they're, you know, nuisances. Um, etc. I, I would say that being involved in, in your community and knowing A, what's being sprayed, uh, understanding when it's being sprayed and why, those are all important things. Some There are mosquito sprays which are not toxic to bees, so there's um, these uh, biological spray agents that, that just simply don't affect bees, um, the BT sprays and things like that. There are other sprays which, yeah, can have an effect on bees. Um, I think like fogging entire neighborhoods is probably a bad thing, um, but certainly spot spraying for mosquitoes and, um, you know, mosquito controls that are put into uh, aquatic environments, uh, they aren't going to affect bees um, directly. So, uh, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a very difficult one. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, I think you should find out what's being sprayed, uh, when it's being sprayed, uh, and then I would actually recommend talking to your county extension agents about whether they think that's going to be an issue with bees or not. If you're concerned about your bees and how they're impacted, um, that's usually a great source of information going through extension. Great. Do adult bees ever eat pollen? Yeah, they do. Um, in fact, uh, most adult bees will consume some amount of pollen as adults. If, if you think about it, the, the, those female bees are growing their ovaries and they're, you know, um, ovipositing these eggs. Eggs take a lot of protein to produce an egg um, in a bee, just like it does in a chicken. Um, and so you, so as a, as a female bee, you have to, to eat some form of protein and you can't just feed on nectar. It has to be, that protein comes from pollen, generally speaking. So yeah, they're eating some pollen, they're digesting it. It's not the main part of their diet, but it is an important part of their diet. So yes, most female bees are feeding on I say most because I'm sure there's an exception. Someone will point out to me if I don't say that, but most are feeding on some pollen. Okay, we'll just do a couple more questions, but here's one I know you'll like to answer. How's a new bumblebee queen created? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, this is actually one of the great, um, great mysteries of bumblebee um, production. Um, as a colony grows, you get, the colony gets to a certain size uh, throughout the year and there's been some studies on some species of bumblebees so this is a generalization across 260 species based on one or two studies um the so the colony will grow and, and generally what we find is when the colony starts to get crowded so it, it gets to a certain size um they switch from from producing more workers that are going to forage more and bring in more resources to producing uh males and new queens uh, and at this tipping point in the colony, um, it seems that it is uh, sparked by the size of the colony, not by resource availability, or um, there's maybe some tie-ins to day length uh, and, and how that cues it in. But essentially, unlike honeybees, honeybees, if they want to make a new queen, 
they take a few of the individuals in the colony and they feed them this really rich diet of um, royal jelly that's uh, mandibular grand, gland excretions, so bee vomit, um, that they're giving to these, but it's a really high protein food source that, that they give exclusively to these queens and a lot of it to make them big. With bumblebees, there's no specialized food source. It's just more pollen. Um, and so they're giving more and more pollen. It makes the bee, these queen bees bigger. Um, and that seems to be what triggers it, not the quality of the diet, but the quantity of the diet uh, that, that really makes the queens. And then there was a follow-up question about um, how many queens per nest, just kind of an average, is there a, or does it just depend so much? Yeah, so I'll say the common Eastern bumblebee, which is Bombus impatiens, it's the one that's commercially available if you wanted to buy it in the Eastern US. Um, you might get say 50 to 100 queens from a single nest, quite a few. Uh, by contrast, there are some other species uh, that would produce many fewer. Um, so uh, the brown belted bumblebee, Bombus griseocolis, is going to produce 20 to 50. So um, queens per nest. So there's a difference based on the species. Um, but yeah, a big bumblebee. I, I once dug up out in the west a Boston Sensky uh, bumblebee nest uh, with another guy. It was under the, the little kid's playhouse. We tipped it over. And there, I would guess there were 200 queen bumblebees in that nest. It was enormous. Uh, so yeah, reproductive potential can be very high. Um, but it can also be, for some species, pretty small. Okay, and speaking of uh, really small, let's have our last question be about how do we see these little tiny bees? Uh, many bees are really <laughs> difficult to see. We need to look at small characteristics. Do you have suggestions for handheld magnifiers or dissecting mm. scopes or apps on the phone? Anything, any help to um, help us all see what, what you see? Yeah, so I, I mean, if you're look, if you're talking about live bees um, or, okay, so if you're talking about live bees on flowers, your best bets to probably get a really good camera. Um, uh, I don't, I know nothing about photography, uh, really. Um, my wife, maybe she can come in and talk, but I, I'm not a photographer. So I would say a good camera and a lot of practice. And there are um, folks out there that offer actually classes. Alex Wild down at University of Texas offers classes on insect photography. You can put a little plug there for Alex. Um, you can enroll in his classes and learn how to do insect photography. Um, there's, uh, but I'd say like one great way to do it is if you're, if you've got a net um, with a fine mesh uh, net bag to it, you can catch bees, you can put them in a little vial and, and, and chill them in your refrigerator till they quit moving um, and then put them under a microscope. And, and there are a number of microscopes available that are, are not super expensive. There's, you can buy these ones called dino lights, which are, you plug them into your computer. They've got a U, little USB plug. Um, and you can use these dino lights. Um, they're handheld digital microscopes are about hundred dollars. There's some cheaper ones out there too. I mean, you can find that that are not too bad um, or simply a magnifying glass or hand lens. I would get something that's at least uh, 20 mag, you know, 10 to 20 magnification, probably 20 is good for these little tiny things. But um, yeah, that's, that's my advice. There's, you, it depends how much money you want to spend, but there's definitely resources out there um, if you're interested.